The Unshackled Waves, episode 176. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One of the biggest frustrations of living in Australia is easily its nanny state laws. Now what is the nanny state? It refers to laws which restrict our vice and recreational behaviour for our own good of course, because we are too stupid to know what's good for us. One organisation that is dedicated to fighting against such laws as well as other big government excesses is the Australian Taxpayers Alliance and through their subsidiary My Choice Australia. Their Director of Policy is Satyajit Mara. He has appeared before parliamentary inquiries and authored uh, submissions. His work has appeared in News Corp publications, The Spectator Australia, uh, Quadrant magazine, as well as uh, various television appearances, analysing uh, budgets and other government policy. And we are lucky to be joined by him tonight. Uh, Satya, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, there's so much to talk about with Nanny State. As I said, we're, we're basically uh, soaking in it here in Australia, but let's start with the, the obvious, which is our tobacco laws, or uh, more to the point, the, the taxes on tobacco, which uh, it's gotten now where uh, uh, tobacco prices, they're now above uh, $1 a, a cigarette stick. So if you bought a 40 pack of cigarettes that may cost you about 43, uh, for, uh, 45. And of course, uh, this is because uh, smoking is bad and we need to uh, discourage it. But what has been the, the actual effects uh, of, of this policy? Because, and I think this is going to be a theme all throughout the evening, uh, unintended consequences. Yeah, sure. So um, the whole idea is you hike up the tax on cigarettes, firstly because, oh, well, you know, uh, we have a public health care system, so we end up paying when these people get smoking-related diseases. That idea made a bit of sense, so they tapped on some tax onto cigarettes. Uh, then later on, it evolved into, no, hold on, that's not enough. We need to add more tax on uh, so that we actually discourage people from picking up cigarettes in the first place. Then that money got tacked on. Since then, every three months or so, there's a further hike for the excise, the point where we now have the most expensive cigarettes in the world, about uh, you know well over $35 a pack. And for some strange reason, uh, our smoking rates, which have been falling across the Western world for years, we're the only country in the Western world where even with our expensive cigarettes, uh, the rate of it falling is actually stagnating. Uh, more people are smoking in this country today than they were back in 2013. And all you're doing with that kind of tax on a product people are addicted to is you're taking money out of their pockets. And the poor, the poor, the working class are the ones who struggle the most to quit, who don't, you know, often don't have enough social support and who smoke as a way to de-stress in their lives, overcome depression or even mental illness. And really, it's the worst, most regressive kind of tax. I mean, it's one of the worst, most regressive ta kind of taxes you can have. But the government loves it because it brings so much money in. And what we now see, we've got... Uh, black market in tobacco, which is over $15 billion a year and a year in industry. And that money goes directly into the pockets of organized crime syndicates and even terrorists. And this isn't me saying it, it's the Australian Federal Police. Uh, to the point where in this year's budget, they've got a billion dollar task force on illegal tobacco, uh, which is a problem that has technically been created by the government itself. Uh, by making this product so insanely expensive, you know, under good pretense, uh, but clearly it's not doing its job and we need to do a lot better than that. Yeah, I call that that, that government task force the Seymour Butts Squad, uh, which is uh, governments, they're, they're the real addicts in this uh, tobacco uh, trade. They're uh, addicted to the revenue, but they can disguise it that it's it's for your uh, own good. But the thing is, if you, if you don't know that the, the health effects of smoking today, there, there's so much... <laughs> Uh, education that and we, we also should keep in mind that people make a judgment that I know that this cigarette smoking is bad for my health that or it may uh, doesn't always kill you it may may eventually kill you that's uh, 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 that's what uh, that's uh, uh, what do you say <coughs> uh, that's the reality of it so people make a 
a decision about do I want, do I value the joy of smoking and what that brings me uh, more than the, the uh, potential health benefits I'd get from not smoking? Yeah, sure. Um, smokers already pay in excess of 200 times the cost of the healthcare system. So this is no longer about uh, health issues. As far as I'm concerned, if you want to smoke and you want to take on the risk that you will eventually get lung cancer or some other illness, that's your choice. As long as your choice isn't negatively harming other people, um, I don't think that there's any moral grounds to coerce you into not doing it. And I think it sets a bad precedent for other things. You know, next stop alcohol, and then, uh, you know, whatever else is next on that list. Uh, anything the fun police is against, fast food, for example. Uh, so there's not a road that we necessarily want to uh, go down. Now, if people want to quit, there's many, many options for doing that. And, you know, we have tons of services that will help them to quit if they want to. Uh, but the one major thing which has been successful in every major Western country, except for ours, because we haven't legalized it, is uh, vaping with nicotine. So legalizing e-cigarettes for use with a nicotine liquid, which allows smokers to get the nicotine without getting the tar, uh, which contains carcinogens. That's actually, uh, that's produced when you burn a cigarette. Uh, in the UK, they actually, it's at the point where the doctors will actually tell smokers, prescribe, well, not prescribe, but recommend to them, you should switch to e-cigarettes. And uh, people who, you know, we've done a tour across this country for to legalize vaping. And we've heard, you know, thousands and thousands of stories of people who struggled to quit smoking and they switched to vaping. And now, you know, they're able to run after their kid. They're more fitter. They're feeling better. They've had years added to their lives. Uh, but the Australian government is just sitting on its ass and not legalizing a proven effective solution. And the only, you know, rational reason I can think of is they love all the tobacco tax money. Yes, uh, I've. I've seen you uh, around uh, with Vape for Force One uh, all around the country and even visited uh, my hometown of Hastings where I got to speak with uh, the uh, the captain of the uh, Vape Force, uh, Brian Marlow. Yeah. Um, you uh, you ended, uh, ended up uh, congregating in uh, Canberra where uh, some politicians are receptive to uh, lifting the, uh, the prohibition on uh, vaping. Uh, it's uh, it's worth probably uh, you stating again what is the, the, the state of the law because you can't buy them but you can import them. You, you can import a small amount of personal use, but the problem is possessing it is illegal on the state law. And the penalties vary from state to state. Uh, in, I think it's Western Australia, you could be fined up to $40,000 just for possessing the nicotine solution. That is good for you. I mean, that isn't going to kill you. Whereas you can legally go down to the store and buy a pack of cigarettes and give yourself cancer. So the law is absolutely perverse. It's turning innocent people who want to make a good decision for their own health into criminals. Uh, and it's something which every person I've spoken to, whether they smoke or they don't smoke, whether they absolutely hate cigarettes, um, they're all up in arms, very angry about this. I mean, how can we how can we allow the situation to happen? It might affect a very small percentage of the population, but we should be absolutely concerned that government is trampling down on individuals' rights in this way. Now, do you buy the, the conspiracy theory at all that uh, there's these laws against vaping because the government secretly wants smokers to keep smoking so they can get the revenue? <laughs> Look, I, I don't really have my tinfoil hat on right now. I'd like to think things aren't quite that bad. Uh, but it really, you know, the way the laws are, it's so perverse that, you know, who knows? I mean, Alex Jones turned out to be half right about the, the hormones and telling the frogs gay or something, right? <laughs> Obviously, the, the decision is made by the, the federal health minister, Greg Hunt, and here so far he's been adamant, even even though, like uh, like I mentioned before, you've got some politicians on board and uh, uh, a lot of the media on your side as well, Ben Fordham on 2GB, uh, Paul Murray on, on Sky News, there is a bit of uh, ground well uh, support for this, but uh, it, it's it's just that it's it's falling on deaf ears at the moment. Look, there's a lot of ground groundswell support. The issue is the people sitting in positions of power, many of whom support this cause, many others who support it, but they're afraid to come out in public and support it uh, because they want to focus on other issues that you know, maybe they think are bigger vote winners or something. Uh, we had an inquiry recently uh, where the three members of the inquiry, so Trent Zimmerman, uh, Andrew Leming, uh, both liberal, um, and I can't remember who the third person was off the top of my head right now. Uh, but three 
uh, might have been, mm, I'm not sure. Anyway, three MPs came out strongly um, in support of legalizing vaping, and they were the dissenting MPs. The remaining, I think it was four, unfortunately, sided with uh, groups like the Cancer Council who you know, publish a lot of junk science in this and other areas, um, and came out against it. Now, the thing is, these three guys had were the guys who had at actually attended the most physical hearings and heard the evidence from both sides and made up their mind. Of the four, of the four or five people who you know voted against legalizing vaping, and just took the default position of our public health agencies, uh, most of them did not manage to attend every or even most of the hearings. Uh, so it just goes to show you that for people who actually inform themselves adequately on these issues, it really is a no-brainer. Uh, you know, this is about saving lives and empowering people to make uh, the right choices. Now let's turn to another vice, which is uh, alcohol. Now, despite the fact that Australians love to, to drink, often uh, to excess, our, our governments uh, don't like us uh, uh, doing that. And uh, what was originally going to solve the, the problem of uh, teenage uh, binge drinking was the, the alcohol pops tax introduced by the, the, the Rudd government in uh, 2008, but that really didn't have an effect. Yeah, certainly not. Um, I mean, all the alcohol pop tax did was, uh, you know, y y you really realize how out of touch these guys are come up with these ideas. I think they're the guys who never got invited to parties as a kid, right? Because what do you do if you're like, you know, an, an edgy 15 or 16 year old who started to drink? Uh, suddenly the drinks you enjoy, you know, those nice sugary ones that get you a little bit buzzed are really expensive. So what do you do? Well, you go to the store or you get whoever's buying it for you to get you a bottle of pure spirits. Uh, and then you make a 50-50 mixer at home with some fruit juice or some cola. And suddenly you're consuming far more alcohol and you might well be paying possibly less per drink than what you'd otherwise pay. So it's absolutely a ridiculous and stupid tax that they passed uh, just to make themselves feel good because the kids are still drinking. Uh, it's done nothing to stop binge drinking. In fact, I would say it's encouraged binge drinking because if you're sitting at home mixing your own drinks, you're going to mix them a lot stronger, obviously, and you're going to get smashed quite easily. Um, so it just goes to show you, you know, more do good policy and feel good policy that is completely counterintuitive and has these unintended effects. And uh, one aspect of the nanny state we haven't explored uh, yet is the public health lobby, which often is funded by us, the taxpayer. And of course, uh, increased alcohol taxes is something that they're always lobbying for. And there's this push to introduce uh, or a tax alcohol per content, or what's known as a, a floor price, which would as astronomically raise the price of uh, wine and, and beer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they were talking about having a price floor for wine. You know, you know, forget about playing Goon of Fortune. It's going to be Goon of Misfortune, you know. Um, and it, it's really, uh, you know, one thing that annoys me is that it's very easy for people to say when some study comes out, supporting you know people's rights to do something it's the first question we get is who's funding this uh, even if the funding is completely you know not for profit from individuals it doesn't matter the first question is who's funding this is some industry or some company funding this is someone who has an interest uh, selfish interest in this issue supporting it but people aren't able to see the far more obvious problem which is in public health funding which is a series of organizations that are dependent on the government to give them funding to lobby for more government policy or to lobby for policy the government supports. That's a perverse incentive right there. You know, um, and often, surprise, surprise, these guys who rely on taxpayer funding want bigger taxes on things. And that usually ends up in being them getting more funding, more research grants to tell us uh, how bad our drinking problem is and to lecture us you know, from their ivory towers. Um, and it's really something that we would like to see a lot less of quite frankly. There was a, a small victory in the federal budget. I take uh, any victory against the, 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 the nanny state and celebrate it, the, the craft beer uh, tax uh, reduction. Um, so, so there is uh, hope for us still. Yeah, there is. Uh, we actually, uh, not to toot, well, obviously to our own horn, but we were lobbying for that for a while. And in 2017, we presented uh, the, well, the idea, it's one of those really perverse, bizarre things, right? Because under the previous regime, uh, you would tax craft beer based on the size of the keg in such a way that the people with smaller kegs, so your craft brewers, your independent brewers, paid a higher rate of tax than the guys with the bigger kegs, uh, being, you know, your big union brewer, uh, breweries and so on and so forth. 
Um, and uh, the Senate, you know, took up our recommendation, and it's been passed into law now um, by, you know, the Treasurer announced it one or two months ago. Um, but we have a long way to go. There's, a lot, you know, we, you know, for every five um, rum and cokes you order, the taxman, you know, he takes three of them. You know, um, the taxman is a piss tank. You know, he really, you know, like it, it's a terrible situation, and we really would like to see a more faith put into. Uh, people's ability to enjoy themselves responsibly and policies that single out the people who do the wrong thing, not people who simply enjoy a drink, which is most of us. And of course, it's not just uh, cigarettes and alcohol that the government and the, the public health lobby want to uh, tax and regulate. It's uh, also oh, fast food or uh, junk food. Uh, and of course, they, they were given a big uh, boost, uh, dare I call it a sugar hit, uh, by a Four Corners uh, episode earlier in the year on the, the sugar lobby, which... Uh, blamed uh, big sugar for stopping the introduction of a, a sugar tax and there's there's two types of uh, food sin taxes there's uh, sugar tax and fat tax i don't know uh, how our policymakers decide which one they're going to introduce well um the one country that i think recently tried a fat tax uh, was denmark and it ended quite terribly um it ended up having absolutely no effect i mean it ended up being uh, i remember now so it made things like butter and margarine really expensive to the point where people started switching to discount supermarkets and actually buying even more food than they did before. And as a result, a lot of these discount supermarkets were able to increase the prices on butter and margarine, which are, you know, to some degree, they're necessary foods, especially in, you know, Northern European cuisine. Um, we're able to increase the prices well beyond the actual, uh, you know, amount that the tax would was meant to push it up. Uh, so all that happened is people ended up paying more for the same or even more food. People didn't get any slimmer. People didn't eat any less. You're just taking more money out of their pockets. Uh, and sugar taxes are quite similar. It just doesn't make any sense to single out one ingredient. You know, we know sugar is bad for us. But why are we sing singling out sugar when the increase in obesity in our countries has to a large degree coincided with actually a decrease? Uh, in recent years of sugar consumption. You know, as diet and no sugar alternatives have hit the market, people are switching. Consumers don't prefer that sickly sweet taste as much as they used to. Um, and so really the market is responding without a sugar tax. All you're doing with a sugar tax is you're punishing, you know, people for purchasing groceries, for indulging themselves. It's just a virtue signaling policy that takes money out of people's pockets. Yeah, you're exactly right that the, the market is able to solve the, the obesity epidemic. I mean, you just have to look at the, the popularity of uh, a diet plan uh, companies and uh, e everywhere you go, there's always a 24-hour uh, gym opening up. I think in, in my hometown, we've got about three or four 24-hour uh, gyms now. They're, the people, you know, they are, they are aware that you know they they are getting uh, obese and want to want to do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing is, um, to a large degree, the problem of the obesity crisis is quite conflated, actually. So um, we basically uh, statistically we determine the obesity rate based on body mass index, so your height divided by your weight or something to that effect. Uh, and at 25, you're considered overweight, and once you hit 30, you're considered to be obese. Now, the number 30 comes because uh, theoretically at that point you start having a higher risk of a lot of health conditions. But 25 is completely made up. 25 was simply a round number that originally stood for at risk of obesity. Uh, and they've done studies which have found that uh, at uh, 25 BMI, you actually live the same or even longer than people at below 25 BMI. Uh, in fact, it might even be protective against certain kinds of cancer to have a bit of, you know, to be a bit beyond 25. Uh, we're not sure exactly why, but people theorize about it. Um, and yet, a lot of the time when people tell us how bad the fat epidemic is, they will often give the statistic that clubs together everyone above 25, so overweight and obese, and say, oh, look, half the population is overweight or obese. This is a huge problem, when it actually really isn't. Also, you know, BMI doesn't take into account uh, how much muscle you have. Muscle is heavier than fat is. Um, so there's all these sorts of problems and it gets even worse for kids because they have a separate metric for what's a healthy BMI for a kid because kids grow faster than adults do. Um, and it's just, 
it's the point where the guy who wrote the study that gave that metric said, this is built on sand. He said that himself. And here we have all these governments around the world pushing that. Um, and um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the report that actually advocated that that, that be adopted was funded um, by the pharmaceutical industry. You know, this isn't tinfoil hat stuff. And they funded by the pharmaceutical industry who quite clearly have a lot to gain from people being really worked up about being overweight or obese. So it's, it's really a bizarre and unfortunate problem that we have. I hadn't heard of that before, so yeah, the, the problem might not be uh, as bad as it's, it's made out, so we should definitely take a second look whenever we see that uh, story of uh, obesity levels out of control. Now you're in the city of Sydney where you've had the, the lockout laws uh, at yep. nightclubs for, for a number of years and uh, uh, the, the city has got safer. I mean, uh, in, in, if, you, if you mean by safer, no one goes out at night. I mean, it's, it's going to be safe if, if that's the case. Oh no, the real estate developers are loving it. You know, all they did is they swooped down, they bought up all these um, former night spots, turned them into little apartment blocks fill them with, uh, you know, yuppies. Uh, I'm sure a lot of Greens voters are in there as well. Um, and uh, look, I mean, at the end of the day, if your solution to a problem is to cop out completely, say we have a problem with, with uh, violence in our nightlife spots, therefore let's end nightlife. You're, you're thinking about it the wrong way. Why is it there are cities around the world which are open late, open all night sometimes, which often drink more per capita than we do, uh, you know, the rates of uh, dr drinking amongst younger people, for example, are the lowest they've been in generations. Um, and yet you don't have the same problem of, of drunken violence or punch or any of that stuff. Um, and it's interesting because uh, you see higher rates of violence in countries like the UK and Scandinavia than you do in countries like Spain and Italy, where people drink more per capita than, than they do. Um, and one of the reasons I think, and there's a lot of research backing this up, is that our societies, our Western societies, like the UK, Scandinavia, Australia, we send the message to people that alcohol is a social license to transgress from normal norms of behavior. People often excuse uh, absolutely shitty behavior by saying, hey, I was drunk when I did it last night, haha, <laughs> sorry. Whereas the same thing doesn't fly in these other countries. You're responsible for your own actions, certainly more than you are here or, or there. Um, and I think the more we have policies like this that say, if you go out and drink, you will assault someone. If we let you stay out beyond 3.30 a.m., you will assault someone. More people are thinking, hey, alcohol makes me violent. Hey, you know, I'm going to fund someone when I drink. Uh, people who have those tendencies have them aggravated. You know, the guy who punched Kieran, sorry, uh, who punched um, Thomas Kelly. So the boy who got knocked out dead uh, and triggered effectively these lockout laws. Um, that guy was high on a bunch of stuff, a bunch of drugs as well. And he literally took a bus into the city because he didn't even drink in the city. He was drinking at home. He took a bus into the city so he could start a fight. He was going to the city just so he could exercise his license to transgress by punching someone. And he did and he killed someone. And suddenly none of us can go out beyond 3.30 a.m. to have a drink. So it's just a completely perverse approach, which I think favors getting you know, elected by demographics like you know, your senior citizens who don't stay out late drinking over actually saving people's lives. And it's very, very unfortunate. You wrote a uh, good op-ed where you, where you talked about uh, the laws uh, in Victoria that now prevent uh, teenagers enjoying a drink with their, their parents when they're out. And you're, you're right that actually earlier introduction to alcohol in moderation, that actually encourages a culture of, hey, you don't need to uh, drink to uh, excess to have a good time. Because what a lot of the time happens here is that uh, um, teenagers don't drink until they turn 18 and then all of a sudden they're like oh my god i can i can drink uh, i'm going to drink as much as possible until i uh, pass out or, or whatever and th th that's where we get uh, a lot of this over drinking culture from yeah absolutely um i mean it, the victorian example is just such a perverse and terrible thing you know it just really goes to show you how completely out of touch governments can be so under the laws as they currently stand um, a teenager, and we're talking like 15, 16 here, we're not talking about 11, 12. A teenager can sit with their parents at a licensed venue, and they're allowed to legally have one, I think about one glass of wine or something when they're sitting with their parents. So this is just really, you know, a cool way to, I guess, instill good habits. You know, you can go out and just have one drink and enjoy yourself. You don't need to get smashed. 
you don't need to scull that drink. You know, wine is something where, um, you know, it's funny because um, when I was in university, I hated wine, right? Because you go to these parties which had a bar tab on and wine was unlimited. And I would just, you know, be sculling the wine to get smashed. I'd hate it. It just tasted like ass. And then once I started making it a habit of, you know, whenever I drink it, just sipping it very slowly, I developed a taste for it. I started to enjoy it. I, I started drinking less to get high and I started drinking more to enjoy and appreciate the social experience and to, you know, appreciate the taste of the wine, um, you know, which you can't really do with, uh, you know, these sorts of uh, self-mixed 50-50 cheap spirit and goon concoctions that kids are making themselves because alcohol is so expensive. Um, so, so really, it, it is, again, a perverse law that doesn't make any sense. Uh, parents need to set a good example. We need to bring back parental responsibility. And we're getting rid of a, one of the laws that enables parents uh, to do that in a safe, licensed, regulated setting. Um, so really, it's just, you know, getting the problem backwards. Now, probably a more uh, complex vice uh, when, when it comes to stopping uh, government uh, intervention is that of gaming and uh, gambling, because many families have been uh, destroyed by <coughs> problem gambling, and uh, the problem is exacerbated by uh, sporting clubs, uh, that, because uh, poker machines are their main source of uh, revenue, and uh, we also have, uh, adding to that, all those sports bet uh, companies. Uh, every time you, t you turn on a sporting game, there's a, there's a new betting company, and also the, the problem is exacerbated by state governments addicted to the, the gaming revenue as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, look, I sympathize with people who, I guess, uh, can see the amount of damage that people do to themselves when they sit in front of these machines, feeding all their money in. Often families are affected. I think that's the worst thing, you know. I mean, it's one thing if a person pisses their life away at the pokies. It's another thing if they're spending their family's money and they're damaging their children's future because of it. Um, I mean, one of the things that I do have a problem with, though, is that, you know, we had an inquiry on this recently. Online poker, online gambling. Now, um, this is a game of skill, right? This is something where the player actually has some control over the outcome. This is something which is a bit of a social, uh, you know, has a social component to it, online poker and so on. Uh, and yet the government currently has that illegal. So it's illegal to sit in front of a slot machine, feeding money in and letting the house take away your money because, you know, it's pure luck. But it's illegal to play a game of skill online. You have to go to a casino. Often there's only one big casino in our major cities. You've got Crown and Star. Pay hundreds of dollars just to play this game. When you can play online and bet for as low as one dollar. But it's illegal in this country and it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, what was funny is I read a submission to inquiry from clubs New South Wales, actually. I um, might have been New South Wales. Um, and they were saying something that was just so ridiculous. They said... You know, we don't want people gambling at home where it's unregulated. We want them gambling at our club in a relaxed, family-friendly community environment. There's nothing family-friendly about those people sitting there feeding their savings into a bloody slot machine. You know, um, I mean, the guile they, of saying that. Are they looking around <laughs> when they're uh, pressing the button? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I tend not to look their way, but, you know, quite possibly. Like, it, it's just... Um, yeah, it's it's terrible, and it's one of those cases also of, you know, uh, you know, it's lobbying by the competition, right? So they'll claim that it's because oh, we want to encourage safety, we do the right thing, they don't, but really it's just hey, government, please shut down my competitors. We don't need any, you know, we don't need anyone treading on our turf here. You know, it's the old gangland mentality is how I see it, um, and it's unfortunate. Uh, and thankfully, we have some champions like uh, David Lionhelm, of course. And also Corey Bernardi, who's been very solid on these sorts of things, who say, look, you know, it's your right to, you know, there's no logical reason to keep these sorts of things illegal when pokies that, you know, like you mentioned, are such a problem in our society uh, are fine. And I'm fine with people going to the pokies, but let's be consistent with this, you know. One area of the new economy that uh, libertarians like to celebrate is uh, what's called the, the gig economy, which is enabled by technology. For example, ride-sharing service uh, Uber has uh, allowed uh, people using their smartphones to uh, uh, catch a lift, uh, much uh, cheaper and better service than a, than a taxi. Uh, Uber has slowly been legalized uh, around the, uh, the country. Uh, there has also been the... Uh, 
uh, service Airbnb where you can uh, lease out uh, your home or a spare uh, bedroom to, to somebody who wants a cheaper accommodation in your, in your city. But uh, that has led to, uh, well, there's been some teething problems in both of these uh, areas. For, uh, for example, uh, compensating uh, taxi license holders has been a contentious uh, area given that uh, people paid a lot of money for these uh, taxi licenses. And here in Melbourne, we've had a lot of uh, Airbnb and B houses uh, being uh, trashed uh, with uh, wild parties and uh, police haven't entered it because it's unclear uh, who has the, the ownership of the, the house at that time. Uh, do you believe that the, the gig economy has been overall positive or are, are there areas that uh, need to be uh, addressed such as the problems that I've raised? I think it's been overwhelmingly positive and often where it's not positive it's not because there aren't enough laws on it it's because the platform uh, you know, hasn't responded you know, great, in a great way to a, a recent change. I mean, there are some stories uh, from restaurants, for example, that uh, jumped onto Uber Eats, uh, which have, who have not had as positive an experience as they've had with other sort of ride-sharing delivery services. Uh, but then Uber Eats has responded to that, I believe, by changing the way it does things. I mean, and this is what happens. You have teething problems with any new form of technology, with any new platform. Uh, and the companies have to then respond to that, respond to their cu their customers and so on. But that doesn't then automatically become an excuse for government to step in and to often make the problem even worse uh, than it is. Uh, with Airbnb, I mean, at the very least, you know, you have this review system where if you want to, you can choose to only give out your property to people who've uh, got a five-star rating for having stayed at a bunch of Airbnbs before. They're far less likely to throw a party that destroys your place if they haven't, if, you know, they've agreed not to do that. Um, so you already have an inbuilt system that deals with that problem, but the pro issue is the moment you have one exception, and there's always an exception, uh, that becomes a national news story. And suddenly you've got people from industries that have something again, you know, maybe someone from a hotel or something jumping in and saying, see, this wouldn't happen at our hotel because we're well regulated. Why can't everyone else be regulated the way we are? We pay a licensing fee, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the other thing to, to note is um, the, the whole taxi industry thing complaining that you're taking jobs away from hardworking taxi drivers who've paid $10,000 for taxi plate. Um, there's actually more taxis on the road today than there were in 2015 in New South Wales. And I was very surprised to read this, but it's true. And I think one of the reasons is contrary to what we've been told, taxis do have certain um, utility, which Uber doesn't have in one respect. And that is, well, if your phone's out of battery, if you're riding your cab rank, the taxi's there. If you're in the city, and you're trying to get around, you would usually prefer to get a taxi that's in front of you than spend 20 minutes or 30 minutes sometimes waiting for an Uber to weave its way through traffic. Uh, and the Uber might not even have the best idea of how to get around the city that a cab driver who's more experienced has. Uh, so you pay more, but you get a certain utility out of it. So they do have a niche even in the market, even in our gig economy. Uh, whereas the people who normally drive Uber, they're doing it to supplement their income. They're you know, single mothers or stay-at-home mothers or stay-at-home dads. Uh, people who are in between jobs, uh, who don't have to go on welfare because, you know, they're able to supplement their income with Uber. Um, and really, it's just overwhelmingly a positive thing. Uh, and the issue is you've got these people, these sorts of uh, socialist types to jump in and say, oh, people are being exploited. I'm sorry, but in what world is someone who's happy to be supplementing their income uh, with an extra gig uh, in between full-time jobs? How, how are they being exploited? You know, is it because they're making money that you don't like? You know, these people, they just want to dictate their morals and their values onto everyone. When what we have is an economy that is now so agile and so um, adaptable, precisely because of innovations like Uber, like uh, home, you know, um, short-term home lending services like Airbnb, Stays, Expedia, and so on. Uh, and this absolutely should be encouraged. Government regulation should encourage innovation, not discourage it. Now, the gig economy has also been under attack from the trade union movement uh, as part of uh, their campaign against uh, independent contractors, which they see as a loophole in our workplace laws because uh, you're able to pay people below the, the minimum wage. And this is called the, the, the change the rules uh, campaign. Do you believe that people who sign up to Uber or Deliveroo uh, uh, are being exploited? Uh, certainly not. Um, absolutely not. At the end of the day, the, the whole basis for their model is that people are paid not based on a set number of hours, 
uh, but based on a per trip basis. Uh, you can work as much or as little as you want to, and you will effectively make either more or less than someone with a fixed job and fixed hours. And in return, you get a large amount of flexibility. You can tailor it to fit around your life. Now, you might say um, someone who is only ever driving uh, an Uber or a rideshare uh, as their only source of income is worse off doing that rather than, say, working as a taxi driver, which they have the option of getting into if they want to. Like I said, more taxis now than before. Um, or doing some other job. But um, again, that's, you know, if they're, no one's forcing them into doing that. There's, uh, they can go in the taxi industry. There's a number of different things that they can choose to do. A lot of the people who do drive Uber tend to be people who are looking for something on the side, something to tide them over in between jobs, sometimes just for fun and a bit of extra money. Um, I don't think any of these people would consider themselves to be exploited. They might say they'd like to make a bit more money from what they're doing. But, you know, we have five, six different ride sharing services all competing with each other. Uh, and we have the taxi industry that still exists. So really, there's no question of exploitation here. It's a term and arrangement, which is you know suitable for many people, not suitable for everyone. But that goes the same for any job. Some people don't want to be you know, in a permanent fixed job. Some people need the security of one. And as long as we have an economy that gives you those sorts of options, uh, no one can claim to be exploited. I definitely think that, yeah, I do agree with change the rules is that uh, stop with the, the rest of the labor market being so uh, so regulated. I mean, uh, the, the fact that these uh, so, uh, the gig economies are being allowed to f flourish is because it hasn't been uh, subject to the, uh, the same uh, regulation which uh, has, has seen a job shedded in uh, traditional businesses. If we were able to uh, change the rules then for more workplace uh, flexibility, I'm sure other people working for traditional uh, retail outlets would, would, be able, would find that uh, there'd be abundance of work. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in, uh, it's easy for us to sit here in New South Wales where our economy is doing quite well and say, oh, we need, you know, higher minimum wages and because, you know, our employment is pretty good and let people make more money. You know, don't cut my penalty rates. I deserve to make double what I normally make because I work on a Sunday instead of another day. Uh, it's fine for us to say that, but, you know, in places like South Australia, for example, where youth unemployment is very high um, and unemployment in general is higher than, the, than in many other places in the country. Uh, there is a genuine trade-off because what is a min minimum wage? It's actually a price floor on employment. It says to an employer and an employee who are willing to work with each other, it says, hey, it's illegal for him to pay you to work that, or it's illegal for him to pay you uh, to work with that amount of money. What isn't illegal is us giving you a far lesser amount in welfare to do nothing. And for a lot of people, there's certainly a lot more value to working, uh, you know, a job that's minimum wage or below minimum wage when you first start out, than there is to not working at all and you know relying on other forms of support. Um, so, so really, I think there's this mis there's a misunderstanding around this issue that's due to a lot of emotion. And I sympathize with anyone who, you know, would be making more money uh, with uh, more regulations than they would without it. No one likes a salary cut. But the problem is when that negatively affects other people by denying them employment prospects, when that negatively impacts businesses by you know, preventing them from hiring more staff or investing in more uh, products and things like that. So I think we need to really work and change the narrative. Unfortunately, industrial relations is considered a uh, you know, political poison in this country right now. The last real move that we had in favor of you know, good solid industrial relations was um, under John Howard. Uh, and Labour lobbied for their Fair Work Commission, their independent commission to set centralized award rates for different things. They got their wish, and e even now they're not happy with the decisions being made. And they're, they're somehow blaming the Liberal government for the decisions of their independent commission. So um, it, it's really, you know, we need to work on our messaging and we really need to work on uh, informing people about these issues because it's really crucial not just to people's employment prospects and ability to pursue what they want to in life, it's also crucial. Uh, to Australia's future growth. Now, I want to test your uh, I, 
guess uh, I would call it your response to other areas which are considered part of the, the nanny state, but which a lot of people consider necessary regulations. So for example, yeah. safety uh, requirements, uh, pool fences, uh, that yeah. uh, children's uh, playgrounds, they, they need to have a certain level of, of safety. Where do you sit there? Well, um, it, it depends on the specific, I mean, for each issue, I take it on a case by case basis. You know, at the ATA, we're not purely ideologically driven. Right, we're not just. Oh, I want a world with no rules. I mean, I guess you know some people who worked here might secretly be, um, but you know, for me, it's not about no regulation. It's about smart regulation. It's about regulations that actually work, and uh, you know, don't impose too much of a burden on people. You know, a regulation that says uh, you know have a gate there so your three-year-old doesn't wander into the pool and die, is I don't think a bad one to have. It imposes no real major restriction. It doesn't impose too much of a cost on people. Uh, and it ultimately does save a life. So, you know, on a cost-benefit analysis, I'd say that's a good one. Um, seat belts, I think, in generally are, are a very good thing. I don't think that it imposes too much of a cost on someone to put their seat belt on. Um, and, and I think uh, now with something like bike helmets, I take a different view. So with bike helmets, um, yes, they might save more lives, uh, you know, if someone wears one than if they don't wear one. That's true. But it's actually discouraging a lot of people from taking out biking. You know, the feeling of the wind in your hair and these other things. Um, and a lot of people are discouraged from doing an activity that activity that's really good for them because of these dopey bike helmets that they don't want to wear because there's a fine attached to that. And I think in terms of cost and benefit, you would rather give people the choice of taking that risk on. You absolutely should wear a helmet, but because you choose to, not because the government put a gun to your head or a fine to your head and forced you to. Um, and ultimately, I think if someone's riding around without a helmet, that could be something for insurance companies to potentially deal with, with higher premiums, for example, um, for, for those people who do that. So, um, you know, it, it's a case by case basis. But, you know, let's have some common sense and let's not impose uh, too much of a burden in terms of cost or time or resources on ordinary people uh, under the guise of moralizing at them. Well, speaking of that, there's another uh, type of regulation which is considered for our own good, and that is uh, speed limits and uh, speed cameras. Uh, a lot of people see them as just uh, revenue raising, and there was in the, the early days of the Barry O'Farrell coalition government, they actually removed uh, some uh, speed cameras because uh, they found that they didn't actually improve uh, road safety, and that's often also pointed out to us that our speed limits, uh, uh, for example, it's mostly 100, 110 uh, on uh, freeways, but in countries such as Germany on their autobahns, you can go 130. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've heard that on the autobahn, you could go up to like 180 or 200 even from what I've heard from my friends over there. Um, I, I, you know, the Germans, they're, they're all sticklers for rules and for order and for every, you know, everything should conform. This is how it, the way it's done. <laughs> And even they can practically see that, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do 180 down the U-Bahn, sorry, the Autobahn. Um, our speed limits absolutely are too high, some of them. Uh, and I think, you know, we have this overly cautious, almost anti-Larrikin culture in this country now because of these sorts of laws. And there, there is also revenue raising component, absolutely. Um, you know, we often hear about stories coming out about, you know, councils or about road cops having revenue targets that they're meant to meet. Um, and ultimately, that's just a perverse incentive to go after people, sometimes on flimsy claims, uh, which they can, you know, there are plenty of people go to court and challenge a speeding fine, for example, uh, on flimsy claims because odds are the guy isn't going to contest it. It's not worth the effort. Uh, and really, it's just another way that the government milks money off innocent people often. Um, we should have smart speed limits that actually have a bearing on safety not have these low ones that just stop people from getting to where they're going at a good time and then lead to people paying money for nothing. And uh, another area of uh, road safety that uh, there's beginning to be a crackdown on is that of uh, mobile phone and tablet use in cars, which uh, is widespread. Uh, 
many people uh, do it, even though we know that uh, we shouldn't do it. Uh, chat, well, not uh, on the phone or texting, but just checking uh, messages because we're, if we've all got uh, Messenger and there's a ping uh, every, every every 30 yeah. seconds or so, uh, yet it's something people do and now there's technology that is actually able to crack down on it and inevitably find people for doing that. Uh, where, where do you sit on that? Is that just another form of revenue raising or do we, do we really need to, people to stop doing this? I think, uh, I mean, I personally am quite sympathetic to that, to be honest. I think there is a genuine reason for that. You know, if you're driving a car, you know, we've had these huge problems where tons of crashes have been caused by people distracting their phone. Forget about cars. There's people, pedestrians in the street mm -hmm. who end up, you know, falling into ditches and dying and getting hit by a car because they were staring at their phone. So this is a genuine problem, and I think there is a rationale to make that illegal. Um, that being said, you know, pictures have surfaced of police officers on their phones in front of the wheel, you know. So if uh, the if our authorities are going to moralize at us about something like this, that, you know, even is a good thing, they should not be hypocritical about it, you know. Um, but, you know, all within reason. If someone's at a traffic light and the traffic isn't moving and they're looking at their phone, I mean, come on, that should be fine. I'm not sure exactly if the law captures that as well. But uh, that should be absolutely fine, in my opinion. Uh, let's move on to arguably the most contentious issue in the, the nanny state is that, is that of uh, drug uh, prohibition. And this is probably yep. where uh, politicians who are critical of the, the nanny state, such as Cory Bernardi, probably uh, differ from the likes of, say, uh, da uh, David Linehaum. Now, uh, now obviously, the, the easiest case to, to make uh, for uh, uh, legalizing uh, illicit substances that of uh, marijuana because uh, heaps of studies have shown it is uh, less dangerous as alcohol. That's uh, uh, is that so uh, something at the uh, I know at the the ATA you try to stay away from contentious uh, social issues. Are you able to uh, say where where you sit on on this issue? Well, I mean, you know, we've never taken up a campaign to legalize weed. You know, four twenty blazer. One of the, I mean, I think one of the reasons is you know, a lot of libertarians are actually reluctant because of the whole negative stereotype of stoner libertarians, you know, you know, dude weed, LMAO. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we have actually written some op-eds, some articles on this topic over the years, you know, on things like pill testing kits, on things like, you know, more liberal uh, drug reforms. Uh, and something I personally quite strongly believe in from both a libertarian and a conservative standpoint, actually. And I think there's a strong conservative case, which boils down to you know, what's more important? Is it saving lives or is it lecturing people about what they should or shouldn't do? Um, if your drug policy is not effective in saving lives, if countries that are more liberal in the approach to letting people get drugs are saving more people's lives and having more people who might use said drugs like MDMA, for example, but still have functional lifestyles, still provide for themselves and still function fine in society the way they do with alcohol, there's absolutely no reason why that shouldn't be legalized. There's no reason why a conservative should oppose legalizing that other than I don't, you know, I don't like it because I don't do it and those kids are doing it. Um, we have a lot of, unfortunately, you know, I'll be quite blunt about this. We have these horrible senile people out there who are against things like pill testing kits, which can save someone from dying at a music festival uh, before they reach their prime, um, simply because they don't like it and not because it's actually doing something to help people out. Uh, in Portugal, in Sweden, in parts of Europe, they have much more, you know, they haven't legalized a lot of these drugs, but they have an attitude towards them that is say, that's basically, look, you know, if you're going to do it, do it safely. And as a result, they have far better outcomes in terms of how people live and get along. Uh, it's not that if you legalize something tomorrow, everyone's going to take it up. You know, Colorado legalized weed. And there's some evidence that fewer, slightly fewer people do weed in Colorado than they did back when it was illegal. Uh, maybe because the, the social taboo on it, you know, made it a little bit mysterious and that actually drew people to it. We don't know. We can hypothesize about these things. Uh, so I just think, you know, have a smart and sensible policy that's not rooted in ideology, but in common sense. No one is saying that I've heard of has said legalize meth, make meth freely available, because we know that the um, social repercussions, the fact that you completely lose your faculties when you can't provide, you know, can't get it, it leads to higher crime rates. It affects the poor. So that's that, too yeah. much for you, would you say? Like that's ice. Where, yeah, I draw the line at ice and heroin 
What, uh, what do you make it then? Because obviously down here in Melbourne, it's been uh, contentious, the uh, drug injecting room in, <laughs> in, in Richmond here, which uh, it has already saved quite a, quite a number of lives, but er everyone is uncomfortable with the fact that there's this uh, facility, which is, well, as it's, as its name suggests, is facilitating people taking these heavy drugs, heroin and ice. Well, in a way, it's similar to the people who complain that oh, there's a public housing commission opening up near where I live. Property values are going to go down. Amenity is going to change. I don't like it. You know, we don't like things that, you know, not in my backyard. Um, so really, you know, for most of these people, I'd say, you know, just suck it up. Take a cup of concrete and harden up, you know. Um, unless there's genuine evidence of, uh, you know, crime increasing or people being under threat, which I understand there hasn't actually been, you have nothing to complain about about a safe injecting room near there. In fact, usually they will set up these injecting rooms in places like Sydney's King's Cross, where um, you already have a drug problem. And having that injecting room there is therefore a positive influence. It ensures that these guys are able to do what they do without killing themselves or contracting HIV. Um, and also without, you know, overdosing or potentially attacking someone in a fit of stupor, which sometimes happens with some drugs. Yeah, it's quite a complex uh, area uh, where we've, we've got to find ways to to solve it without uh, overdoing it. But uh, we've pretty much covered all of the, the nanny state uh, issues tonight, so I've appreciated your time, uh, Satya. Keep up the, the good work at the uh, the Taxpayers Alliance, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly uh, keep an eye on each other. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, it's been a good chat. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. The next big public event in Melbourne is the March for Men on Saturday the 25th of August at 1pm at Federation Square. It is designed to bring attention to men's issues and say that it is okay to be masculine. It is being organised by local social media personality Sydney Watson. The Campaign Against Racism and Fascism and the National Union of Students Women Department are already organising a counter-protest. We'll be there to cover the event from both sides. The next international guest Yes, coming to Australia is former UKIP leader and Brexit champion Nigel Farage this September, visiting all the major cities as well as Auckland. The campaign against racism and fascism clearly, with not much else to do, have got a planned protest there as well. Tickets and various VIP passes can be booked by going to nigellive.com.au. The Unshackled, I'm pleased to confirm, will be at Liberty Fest 2018 in Brisbane. It will be held on the 27th to 28th of uh, September. Uh, guest speakers that are lined up are uh, Daisy Cousins, uh, Warren Mundine, uh, Senators James Patterson and Amanda Stoker, as well as uh, former Labor leader Mark Latham. Tickets can be bought for the conference and the various evening events by going to libertyfest.org.au. Also, please remember, we can't do all of this without your support, so please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Also, uh, please consider sending us a one-off contribution via PayPal, and I've noticed that many of you have been doing that lately, so thank you for that. It all goes uh, a long way, so you can go to our PayPal Me link, which is at uh, paypal.me slash The Unshackled. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.